absolutely geared to your operation. We'll test it. When you're really happy with it, we'll lock that in. Now, they had a very simple innovation for that, not, uh, not unlike some of these large restaurants that have all the tubes coming from wine bottles and they just pour wine out. They have 16 different basic chemicals, tubes coming from them, a little microprocessor that's programmed. When you go to factory X, this is the mix you want. And then out it comes, that custom mix. As cheaply and as cost efficiently as shipping barrels. Um, then they have a little remote monitoring device that just monitors when this thing is coming down. And when it comes down below a certain level, they'll, they'll kick in a reorder to send out the truck and refill the tank. And of course, that shipping guy now can see where all his reorders are, so logistically, you can have a very efficient delivery system to all the different factories. Now, look at it from the customer's point of view. All they have to do now is clean. They don't have to order anything. That's now become like a utility. This company just keeps coming back and filling it up, and as long as they don't charge a fortune, you've no reason to move, no reason to change. You've got no disposal problem. In fact, their major marketing push is in terms of reduced liability to environmental risk. And then the chem station people who put this out there, they then figured out, well, once we got this working and they're proven it, this is a great franchise business. Because the only thing now you need is a really good local operator who cares about what they're doing. So they've franchised that out, so that's now creating an income stream that's letting them grow. And the next guy who wants to come in and compete has to persuade the factory owner, now let me put my tank right where the other person's tank is. Now, what I love about this case is it's not an obvious starting point. If you were starting out you know, thinking about where's a great entrepreneurial opportunity, it's not obvious that it's going to be in commodity cleaning of trucks and factories. Though that's a colossal market, a massive market. Uh, but by taking some very simple technology and applying an awful lot of design sense to, to the problem and figuring out what the customer really wants and then putting together a viable business model, they've come up with a, a great business um, that is profitable now but will be years into the future. So, what are some actual takeaways here? Well, one is it really helps to visualize things. The other professionals who are really good at dealing with ambiguous problems that are hard to solve are, are detectives, FBI agents. Now think about it. You start with a crime, you've got almost no information, no suspects, very tempting to do an intuitive guess of the first guy who's a pattern match with what you think is a likely suspect. But a really good cop displays all the information. You've seen it endless times on television. They have maps of the people, of the events, and they put it up on the screen. There's a good reason for doing that, and that is because our short-term memory is very feeble. That's why we found 17 times 23 very hard. It's very hard for us to memorize those little, very simple operations. Seven bits of information plus or minus two. That's how much we can store up here in very short-term memory. So put it up on sheets of paper. I mean, that is so simple to do, it seems obvious, but it nearly always helps. So I'd urge you in your team projects, when you're working at this ideation stage, to begin with a problem, not a solution. Uh, find out from among team members who's got an observational advantage. That means who has access to a person or a company that's got a real problem and, uh, and they can observe and get information on it. That's usually a great starting point. And when you're on a fast timeline like you are, that speeds everything up very quickly. What they find with really good entrepreneurs is they don't start with blank sheets of paper. They start with who they know, uh, what they know, and who they are. Who they are can be what they're passionate about. Who they know can be places that they can observe. And um, 
And what they know is the expertise they bring. So when you match those three things together, you're going to have probably the optimal place for you to begin. But it may not be the next best place for the person next to you. Um, if I came up with a great entrepreneurial game, like Monopoly, but it's for startups, let's say. And it's fantastic. You've got people losing a fortune and mortgaging their houses and their wives are leaving them and it's a disaster and you've got other people who are making fortunes and they're on the cover of Business Week or even better, USA Today and they're wearing hoodies and giving uh, presentations to banks and, and uh, they're, they're rich beyond measure and you've got everything in between and you've got to play this game. Okay, well, let's say someone's developed that and it really works and it's not, maybe it's a board game or maybe it's a computer game. What do you do with it? Well, what they find in every case with really skilled entrepreneurs is the answer differs depending on who they are. If it was me, I would take it to education because that's what I know. And I would think, yeah, that's all changing very fast. We're now getting these opportunities for free online courses that are... Uh, really good and effective and disruptive, but a simulation like this, that would really fit in great for teaching design thinking and entrepreneurship. That's where I would go with it, because it's my passion, my interest, who I know. Another, my son, he would probably say, younger son certainly would, that's a game. You know, I know games. I'm going to make a game out of that, and I'm going to take that viral and... Uh, It'll become a social game, and I'll have real money, and then people can buy, buy opportunities from me, just like they do in Second Life. And that could be a great model. And we'd probably both be right. So part of the beginning step is to take an audit of who you are, what you know, and what you care about. That's tough for a team, because it means you probably have to defer to someone. But that's always the tough thing in any team, is deferring. But I would urge, start with an observational advantage, find someone who's got a great problem that really matters to them, then understand that problem and map it out. And really what it is, is kind of playing poker, not chess, is the way to put it. Put it. In the game of chess, if you're really good, I'm not at all, but if you were, the opening move determines all the other moves. So they kind of classify moves by different strategies by what the opening gambit is. So you've pretty much cast the die in chess right at the beginning. And an awful lot of startups, I think, make that mistake. They develop an idea, they develop a business plan, they've got an awful lot of money that's needed to launch and make that plan work, and then they find they're committed to that. And if you get a very high valuation, you're especially committed to that. You've got to try and make that 45 degree ramp to the moon that you've promised everybody. And angel investors want a 10 to 1 return in a short period of time, seven or eight years. Five, about five would be nice. Um, that's extremely hard to get. Now poker, if you think about it, poker's a game quite the opposite, where you make as little commitment early on as you can. You play cheap to just stay in the game. Then the really good poker players, when they get a really good hand, uh, that's when they want to really make a big bet. So they make few, but big bets when the odds are hugely on their favor and when they can calculate their odds. They've still got a huge amount of chance going backwards and forwards. Now with entrepreneurship, that's much more like poker. To begin with, you've got almost nothing. You may be persuade yourself you've got an awful lot, but to begin with, you've got very little. Uh, and then when you find a pressing problem and you find a, a, a potential way that you could resolve that problem, uh, then you've got something. It's still not much, but you've got something. You know the website where they sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars really good business ideas? No, it doesn't exist. That's right. No one on the free market pays hundreds of thousands of dollars for really good business ideas. Some angels do, but there is no website. That, uh, lots of people would offer them, but, but there's no bias. For the, because it takes much more than a good idea to get to a business. So I want to finish up by 
Hawking an approach that I think is absolutely fantastic and tailor-made for you guys. 